Hi, I'm Stefan Tarnutzer. I'm responsible for AVL's mobility technologies in the US. I'm here joined today with Bobby Trentafolidis. He's a senior director in business development for us. He's responsible for OEMs here in Detroit, as well as uh, OEMs in California. So both startups and US, as well as Japanese OEMs. So Bobby, thanks for joining us today. My Appreciate pleasure. your time. When you do business development um, with California startups, what do you see, and, and traditional ones, what do you see the main differences being between them to how they operate from a business development perspective and clearly in the theme of this here from an electrification point of view? Yeah, I'd say the, the key difference is speed and focus on technology. So startups are go, go, go fast. They're very vested in their technology. They know what they have to offer, what they bring to the market. They're not very focused on processes or regulations or commercializing their product. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really, really secondary for them. Mm -hmm. Having just came onto the market, sometimes they're even unaware of certain steps they have to take to get to that point, mm -hmm. uh, which is very, very helpful to us having worked with the traditional side, understanding what these processes are, what the steps, what to look out for down the road. Mm -hmm. Would you say then that they're really the California startups as opposed to, let's say, a, US, a traditional US OEM or a traditional Japanese OEM that's in the US, they're much more technology leadership driven, so sort of forget for a moment the features and functions and then industrialization, it's how can I distinguish my product, my vehicle, my mobility vehicle through technology more so than maybe functions and features? I think the distinction, I mean, first of all, let me catch ourselves there and say that Japanese OEMs are also very, very focused on processes, um, similar to the traditional US OEMs. Mm -hmm. Startups are their own bucket. Uh, where they do do things a little bit different. But in terms of how do we approach them, how do we communicate with startups versus either the Japanese or the traditional US OEMs, um, again, the focus becomes very, very much on the technology, finding that right alignment, finding the gaps in the support and the skill sets that they are missing on their end and coming in and filling that and making it a complete team so we can move forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you see the three major trends when it comes to the OEMs in, in insourcing versus outsourcing? I think, you know, sometimes I look at the startups, they have a certain technology, again, going back to what we just talked about, that they, they're going to do this in-house because that's going to be their main differentiator. That's their core technology they want to build the vehicle around. Uh, they may keep that in-house, but what do you see generally the trends uh, between insourcing and outsourcing just in the U.S., with the U.S. OEM, startups and traditional? Yeah, uh, well, with traditional OEMs, I guess, you know, size comes into play, right? Um, everyone's facing some challenges in our market in regards to resources, no matter how big they are. The bigger you are, the lesser the challenges are. Mm -hmm. um, I mean... Obviously, startups have very, very small teams. They're, they're building on teams. It's very, very tough to hire talent nowadays. Everyone's competing for the same talent. So that, that is a trend really there, uh, whether you have the appropriate resources, and then you make that decision, do I need to go outsource, or can I execute this in-house? Uh, that is one thing. The other, um, obviously, is capability. Do I have that capability? Do I know how to do that if I don't have that? Do I need to go to someone like AVL and, and help me get there and learn from them? Mm -hmm. So eventually, maybe down the road, I'll, uh, I'll be able to do that. And then I, I guess the third one I would say is the business model and how either that startup or that OEM um, behaves. Some of them are totally okay with growing, keeping everything inside. No, we want to execute that. That's their mentality. Others are... I don't need to build up every capability. I don't need to get huge. If I need something, I can go to the outside, get that done, finish that project, and move on. Mm -hmm. And have you seen a change in that, let's say, in that behavior, in that trend over the last, whatever, maybe, let's yeah. say, pre-COVID to, to now? Or? Yeah. 
Yeah, I have because again, there's pressures from the market, pressures for resources, speed. Um, mm -hmm. There's also knowledge. I think a lot of even traditional well-established OEM are realizing they don't know everything. Um, Technology is moving very, very fast mm -hmm. today and everyone is playing catch up. Um, just a matter of how quickly can I get catch up with the technology and commercialize it. Okay. So, yes, I'm, I'm seeing trends of even cultures that are not traditionally outsourcing having a trend to outsource more. Okay, okay. What's one trend or one thing that if you could suggest to the startups that they adapt or adopt, not adapt, but adopt from the traditional OEMs and then the same thing vice versa, what would you suggest the traditional OEMs would adopt from what, let's say, the startup yeah. companies are doing? Yeah, I guess the, the, the way I look at that is, um, is striking the perfect balance between speed and um, you know regu regulations and processes and well-established, which come down the road and do validation and verification of the product. Um, Again, you know, with startups, it's all about speed. They don't care too much about processes. How can I get there? Uh, traditional OEMs have been out there for a long time. They understand what it takes, what can go wrong down the road. I have to really validate my, my product. They're concerned about recalls down the road, obviously warranty, huge, huge concerns. So I'd say for traditional OEMs, what they could take away is really re-examining the processes and try to streamline those introduce more speed, faster to market. Um, for startups, obviously a little bit more balance on the validation, on following some of the processes, maybe focusing a little bit on regulations, what might come down the road, mm -hmm. and try to strike that perfect balance. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff that I'm hearing a lot of times is from a, from a traditional OEM, you may get a three, four, 500 page requirements document for a project that they're asking Bobby to, to quote. From a startup, it might be literally 10 pages or less. Do you see that as well? And how, how do you deal with this? I mean, how do, how do? Yeah, that is a, that is a great question. Um, obviously there's a lot of time and effort that goes with that both on the OEM or startup side, um, as well as on our side. Um, Again, with startups needing to go fast, it's a lot more verbal communication, a lot more handshaking agreements. We'll figure stuff as we go along. Uh, the, the traditional OEMs are a lot more rigid. They've been doing this for years. They, they're really focused on what the contract contains and what it doesn't contain, mm. you know, the black and white. Um, I'd say both of them have their benefits pros and cons. Um, it's great to have a well-detailed document to start up from. It certainly takes quite a lot less effort from our end to try to understand what the customer is looking for mm. and come up with our quote in that process. Um, so from that perspective, less effort on our end, a lot more black and white, a lot easier to align on what the project will be about, what it will entail, what it will not. Um, on the startup side, with a very, very condensed scope that's a little bit vague, there are benefits to that because we can co-develop that um, with the startup, with a customer, um, and we can really, really, right at the onset, familiarize ourselves with the project and get a better understanding of uh, exactly what they're doing. So we're we're putting that effort right at the front, but I think it pays dividend at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you agree then that both, dealing with both types of OEM customers, there's, a, there's definitely a, a strong level of collaboration, but it's on a different level. With the, with the startups, it sounds like from what you're saying, it's more on a, on a handshake, more on a, on a understanding, less on a, again, in a four or 500 page document and on the OEM side, it's a large requirement, but then the collaboration is, how do we do this still together at the end? Is that yes. fair? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that is a fair statement. I mm. mean, in the end, even in a very well rigid requirement, you will have pluses and minuses. You will have 
scope trade, you will run into certain things. You might go down a road and say, I don't need to keep going that way and change direction. That can always happen. Of course, you cannot always anticipate everything, especially in much longer projects. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's always collaboration. It's just the, to me, the way I see it is where most of the effort is, is going to take place in regards to defining the scope and defining the mm -hmm. requirements. Has the onset and until now of COVID changed anything in how you interact with customers or how they interact with you on a, on, from a business development Very much so. Um, used to visit my customers quite often, as you can imagine, um, to regular coffee meetups, um, meetings on facilities, a lot more tours from them coming to our facility. Um, so that has slowed down considerably. Everyone's working from home now. We've been in this for a couple of years now. Everyone's really, really comfortable with that mm. working from home lifestyle. Um, probably a little bit weary of going back. Companies are very careful not to change that. Um, so yeah, totally miss that interaction, that face-to-face. Mm. -face. You cannot replace that. Um, I think we've done wonderful trying to adjust to all that, and I think the business is moving uh, rather quickly. So we haven't lost our speed because of it, but that personal interaction um, and creating that relationship on the personal level is uh, really missing there. Mm -hmm. You cannot do that over a video conference or even a, phone, a personal phone call. Yeah. You, need that face-to-face -face. Yeah. so so when it comes to business development and working with customers what's the one thing you're doing today in your job that you didn't do three years ago I mean one thing you just said you're doing a whole lot more video calls so let's leave that out right. for a moment what other thing are you doing today that you did not do or maybe didn't have to do let's say three years ago even again even not at the onset of COVID but even before is yeah. there something that, that you're now doing differently? Um, it's, it's really finite details. I think with the way the technology is moving um, today, we really have adjusted um, to go faster, to respond to the customer faster. Um, we used to take two to three weeks sometimes to get back. Um, uh, on a proposal level with a customer. I think everyone's pushing now. We're trying to streamline our processes on our end. Um, but other than that, I'd say the relationship is still has to be there. You have to reply quickly with a customer. Um, and um, perhaps the alignment and the scope I'd say maybe three years ago, and the way the technology was moving even three years ago was quite different at how it's moving today. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps on the traditional OEM side, there was a lot more definition of what they wanted to achieve and exactly how they wanted to achieve it, where nowadays they're a lot more open to um, taking a second opinion, mm -hmm. being open to understanding, okay, well, Perhaps the technology is moving at a speed I'm not very comfortable with yet. Okay. So I do see some small adjustments like that. Mm. What's the biggest difference you see between, let's say, customers that come to you for traditional powertrains, so the traditional powertrain customers versus the electrification ones? Because you're still doing both today. Sure. Obviously, a big focus right now over the last two years has been the push into electrification. But what do you see the, again, from a particular OEM, let's leave it yep. traditional OEMs, power, traditional powertrain division versus electrification yep. division. Are they approaching you differently? Is, is there significant differences? The approach is, is the same. What they're after is a little bit different and why. Um, from a traditional perspective, the focus is very much on maintaining the product, um, making sure the product is efficient. I think the traditional side has maybe come to terms with the fact that the ICE has a, a finite term, maybe, you know, and we can argue it's 2035, 2040 or beyond. 
but there is a finite um, end of the line there, mm -hmm. let's just put it this way, and the idea is, okay, how can I maintain my product to get to that point? Um, and there, along with that come uh, enormous cost pressures in the market. Um, how can we do more with less? Can we be more efficient? How can we test less? How can we accomplish our task with, mm -hmm. with less cost? On the electrification side, the focus is a lot more on technology. How can I differentiate myself? Everyone is throwing money at it, building labs, trying to differentiate themselves. How can I look into the te technology and totally be different, stand out from the competition? Mm -hmm. um, and the market is quite different um, along with those with those trend come bigger budgets, um, they understand that you really have to invest a lot of money to catch up. I mean, let's be honest, the IC has been around for well over a century and uh, we expect the same quality and same capabilities from battery electric vehicle mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. been around for, you could argue, maybe two decades. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Anything that you feel like is important for the listeners or the viewers to, to hear about electrification and business development? Is there something unique about those two fields, not compared with anything else, but unique to... Electrification yeah. and business development? Yeah. Well, again, uh, I think what's really, really important is to understand where the gaps are, what the customer is really looking for quickly, understand that quickly and be able to make a, a plan, an efficient plan, of how you can best support them. Mm -hmm. um, again, there'll be modifications down the road, there'll be scope trade down the road. Uh, you have to be able to adjust and move quickly with that. Um, again, the market is really um, setting the pace there, and mm -hmm. you have to be able to, to respond to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bobby, thank you for your time. Pleasure. Thanks for everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Reimagine Mobility Podcast. If you liked this episode, please subscribe and tell a friend.